So, Orky, when did you first become interested in aviation? Uh, probably when I was about maybe four years old. I started building models when I was four years old. And just uh, nuts over uh, World War II and military uh, air aircraft models, not anything commercial. And I remember being five years old, building my first model. They were all pretty bad, but I, I built them. And I started painting on them when I was six, seven, eight, nine. And by the time I was 10 years old, I had probably 100 or so models of wow. various World War II and uh, Korean and, of course, uh, jets and stuff. So I, I'd i see jets fly overhead, and I'd go ape, I'd go totally just ape crap. I'd go nuts. I, I knew what they were, you know, that kind of stuff. So I just mm -hmm. – uh, my, my parents didn't quite understand that because I don't come – from an aviation background at all. And, uh, but I would see, uh, air force airplanes and military airplanes go by where I lived or us traveling on vacation someplace or whatever. And I just, I would go ape. I just, just go crazy. Wow. So what year did you join the U S Navy and why did you decide to join the Navy rather than the air force? Well, actually I was uh, air force ROTC started in college as a freshman, as a, 17 year old freshman uh so my game plan uh was to go uh, air force aviation air force pilot training i knew nothing about the navy and so <clears throat> i'm going all the way through air force and college and uh basically the fall of 72 was my senior year at school at oklahoma state university and i was in fip program uh, which is a flying indoctrination program uh started flying cessna 150s I was first in my class to solo in about five hours, you know, just trucking along, just loving it. I mean, just crazy about it. And all of a sudden, the war ended in Vietnam, and all of a sudden, uh, Air Force came into our class the next day and said, hey, all those going to pilot training in a year, stand up. Not so fast. And they basically completely closed down the program. They said it'd be a year before you start flight training. Uh, they're allowing guys uh, out of the Air Force ROTC program. I have a scholarship. Uh, I could have left. Uh, they're letting guys out left and right, just, you know, sign off their their uh, scholarship tu tuition, no problem. And I'm going like, I don't want this. I want to go like right away. I'm going to graduate in December. I want to go. So my colonel uh, at the time said, hey, this is uh, your choice. Go to the Navy. And I'm like, I know nothing about the Navy whatsoever. So I go down to the Navy and sign up and take their test and pass their test, flying colors. Took their physical, and by December, they said, hey, we got you in a class uh, down in Pensacola in April of 73, you know, basically, you know, a few months later. And I said, uh, I'm in. I'm in. I, I knew nothing about what I was getting into at all. And then a week prior to me going to Pensacola, the Air Force called and said, hey, we got a class date for you at, uh, at uh, Williams Air Force Base, and we'll commission you back in December and uh, you're ready to go. And I said, "Not nah, you guys screwed me once, you may screw me again, so I'm going to the Navy. Wow. And I walked in the Navy uh, just uh, fat, dumb, and happy, and uh, away I went. And it actually turned out to be the best deal because I would have made a very lousy Air Force officer. <laughs> Brilliant. So can you tell us some of the aircraft you started training on in the Navy? Well, when I got down to Pensacola, uh, started flying the T-34 Bravo uh you know, the mentor and, uh, flew that. And, uh, I had had, <clears throat> I'd flown a little bit with my, my uncle who had a, had a, a Cessna, uh, Beechcraft. Uh, I guess, I'm sorry, a Beechcraft, a V tail. And I'd flown it about maybe five hours worth, but I, I just sat in the right seat, didn't do anything. So I showed up down, down Pensacola and VT one with, uh, minimal flight experience, but I, I knew this is what I wanted to do. You know, I, I never gotten air sick or anything. Uh, I had gone through uh, summer camp in the Air Force, uh, July 1970 and August 1970 at Little Rock Air Force Base, and I flew in the back seat of a T-33, which I just I thought that was better than sex. I, I mean, it was awesome. <laughs> I was just so sold on being a, a jet guy, so I knew what I wanted. So uh, I got 25 hours worth of uh, T-34 time. I told my instructor, I was the first, his first instructor, he was a jet guy, so he was not happy being there as a primary instructor for little coneheads like I was, you know, <laughs> come from jets, and now he's a, flying T-34s, and I said, I want jets, and I'll do anything to get jets, and so he worked me pretty hard, and uh, back then, uh, grades didn't go in until you soloed, and I soloed, got my check ride, and I soloed, my grades went in. And, you know, one week there might be uh, five jets. The next week there might be no jets. 
So it was all kind of haphazard. And I was willing to sell my soul to the devil. So when it came my turn to get my orders, uh, I was one of uh, five guys that got jets. And I was, I was ecstatic. Wow. I mean, that's pretty impressive. But uh, so what was your first frontline aircraft and squadron? Uh, well, I went down to Beeville, got my wings, flew the A-4, <clears throat> and uh, I'd gotten uh, my orders uh, at the time. Uh, I was the number four guy out of about 35 people that got their wings in our, in our orders. So my fourth choice was A-4s, and so they were going to send me to Lemoore and VA-127, which was a A-4 uh, squadron going for the Hancock, you know, on the air wing uh, 19 flying super foxes and so i had to cq and so i was that's okay fine that's not what i really wanted but you know it's, it's a combat airplane okay it's gray and then basically as i started the, the cq process in the training command they came back and said up oh, we got all our pilots we need for uh, air wing 19 uh you're gonna go to vc squadron so i go like what what's the vc squadron so vc squadron i went to vc5 dead qb which is in qb point philippines at the time, they had TA-4Js and A-4Ls, and the A-4Ls were older than I was. They were all, <laughs> uh, you know, late 50s, early 60s airplanes. They were an A-4 Charlie with if they had spoilers on them, and that made them Lemas. So they were A-4 Lemas with the J-65 uh, engines that had about 6,500 pounds of thrust. Uh, they were very, very uh, anemic, and we'd load them up with full drop tanks, and then carry a 1,000-pound centerline AQM missile that the other guys would shoot at, and we'd take off on a hot 100-degree uh, day in QB and just would get off in about 7,000 feet. I wow. mean, just you keep the flaps down to pass uh, the mountain range there in QB because you just couldn't climb out. It was real, real doggy. But, you know, it was, uh, it was fun. It was single seat, and I uh, got to do a lot of stuff doing that. Well, it had a fantastic roll rate uh, for what it was. And, of course, the A-4 Limas, uh, you know, they were very, very underpowered, big time. But then when I started flying against the A-4F, the Super Fox, and then later on started flying the Super Fox, where basically you've got uh, 11,300 pounds of thrust in the P-408 engine, the airplane empty weight's like 12.5, so you're about 0.95 to 1 thrust to weight ratio. And the airplane was just a, a rocket, a super rocket to fly. Mm -hmm. And uh, you would take off in the A4F with, say, a Hornet on your wing. And, you know, you'd start your takeoff roll and you'd water his eyes because you're airborne about 1,000 feet. <laughs> and you're already 300 knots and you're walking away from the guy. Wow. And this guy's always come back and be like, wow, man, we saw your takeoff roll and you're burning rubber. And I go like, hey, the airplane's uh, got a lot of weight, you know. And, and again, the a 4 it's such an old, grumpy-looking little airplane that when you go against, say, F-15s, one time we had a debt down at uh, Eglin, and we fought some of the big uh, gorilla boys down there that had some MiG kills and F-15s, and we'd go out 1v1 with those guys and just eat them alive because they just couldn't believe that they could crawl in the phone booth and not muscle their way around. And, of course, Super Fox just loves that. You know, it's, it's a great 1v1 airplane, and out there running around with half flaps, and about 85% thrust, uh, you know, power setting, you just uh, walk inside of them and turn inside of them all day long. They, they understand that. But hell yeah. So, so like, thrust was awesome. Yeah, so like, I mean, you, you, you mentioned there like DACTs against the F-15s. Would uh, the Air 4 typically outmaneuver like the, the types of the time, you know, the F-16s, the F-18s? It all depends on how you fought the airplane. You could go out against an F-16, and if he stayed in military power, and you're an A-4F, the A4F will eventually start making angles, and as you drive it into kind of a vertical evolution, uh, it'll start actually using the roll rate and its thrust to weight to start beating the F-16 if it's in military power. Mm -hmm. Once he goes to burner, it's all over with. I mean, he just you know he can start out muscling you out there at that point and, and work vertical on you. And same way with the F-15, F-14, uh, you got to fly a smart fight because. And every uh, the VN diagram, the A4F uh, actually beats the F14, wow. especially in uh, thrust weight out there running around. So you have to fly a smart airplane to uh, to beat the A4F uh, in a Tomcat. But you know, I spent the first thousand hours of my life in the F14 being chased by two old fat reserve guys with double <laughs> bubbles on the A4 and didn't understand how to beat the airplane. So I spent most of my time looking over my shoulder 
Later on, when I got uh, 2,000, 3,000 hours in the airplane, I got smarter about how to fly the F-14 and knew that I could beat any A-4 I went up against. So it wasn't a big deal. Brilliant. So obviously, how long did you spend on A-4s before you got sent to uh, the Tomcat? Well, let's see. I was uh, A-4. I was in that squadron for uh, 15 months in the Philippines. Mm-hmm. And so I flew the A-4 every place. We did we did some ACM, but not much. And I, and I was a novice. I didn't know what I was doing. And then from there, I went back to uh, Beeville, Texas, as an instructor in the T-2. And there's where I really kind of made my, my chops there, learned you know, more about flying, students, instruction, the airplane itself, and, and doing stuff. And I spent two and a half years uh, back in T-2s as the formation phase leader, uh, head of the formation phase. And I flew basically nothing but formation and then guns, air-to-air gunnery. And then CQ phase, and uh, I spent two and a half years back there, and really, really, I, I got with a, with a great bunch of guys that were professionals, and they'd come from the fleet, mm-hmm. and they were maybe a couple of years ahead of me, probably in seniority and age wise. And these guys were all very nice to me and very good to me, and so I followed those guys around like a little puppy dog, and it rubbed off, and I, I basically. I got a lot more professional in my thinking and the way I did business with around those guys. And it was a great, a great squadron tour for two and a half years. And then, I, then I went to Tomcats from there. How did you get assigned? Was it your pick, or did you get chose, uh, chosen to go to that aircraft? Uh, it was my pick to go to F-14s. <clears throat> uh, but I had to be uh, – once you get your wings, you go to a squadron, it's the kind of job and performance you do that rates and ranks you with your other contemporaries. And I was fortunate enough to to be around a lot of good guys that I, I kind of rubbed off on. And I was the number one, number two guy uh, as a JG in the training command as an instructor. So that gives you your choice. Mm-hmm. And I, I chose uh, F-14s West Coast. My detailer wanted me to go A-7s. He was an A-7 guy. I said, no, nah, I would love to send you to A-7s. I want you to go A-7s. And I go, I know, but. F-14 is what I want. So mm-hmm. that's, how, that's how I got uh, Miramar. And at the time, 1977s, I got those early. Uh, only the best were going F-14s. I mean, it was still a very kind of a closed uh, community, and uh, they weren't sending anybody but their top one, two, three guys out of the training command uh, to go fly Tomcats. So it was, uh, it was a tough, tough, uh, a tough book to get. So can you talk us through some of your training? Obviously, coming from an A4, I'm guessing the Tomcat was a leap forward in technology and also power. How did you feel about this? Uh, actually, I, I'd gone from the A4 to the T2. The T2 is a straight-wing airplane, and the O14, uh, you fly it most all the time with the wing speed between the degrees. So it's essentially it's a straight-wing airplane. Okay. So it flew and performed kind of like a super T2 in mill power. So mm-hmm. as far as just flying the airplane around and, and doing stuff with the airplane, it was very similar to the T2 being a straight wing, but I had a lot more thrust to play with. And then, you know, learning the weapon system and learning how to utilize the Rio in the back seat was a big learning curve for you because you, when you fly a single seat, you know, no one sets you down and tells you, well, here you're with a Rio now. So here's what you need to be doing. No one really does that. You have mm-hmm. to kind of go in there and kind of figure out kind of what you want, what you don't want. And, it takes a while to kind of figure out uh, left hand, right hand, what to do. Mm-hmm. And what squadron were you first posted to? Uh, I went through VF-124, or the RAG, and then uh, I was coming out uh, fixing the finish up. And we were fixing the CQ, and I wanted to go to a squadron that had brand new airplanes and also was going to deploy right away. And so <clears throat> that was VF-51 and VF-111. They had brand new airplanes, Block uh, 100 airplanes. Mm-hmm. And I had uh, talked to their CEO. I called the bureau. The bureau said, hey, look, uh, you got to do well in your CQ class to go to one of those two squadrons. And so it's up to you. If you don't, you'll go to a different squadron. But, you know, so I went to CQ. I did real well. I was uh, one of the top uh, two guys in the class of CQ. So I came back and got my choice of VF-51. And VF-51 is where I went. And I basically joined the squadron. I was there in the squadron probably two weeks. I flew one airplane over to uh, North Island to be craned aboard uh, the Kitty Hawk. And then my next flight uh, wasn't until three weeks later off the pointy end off of Hawaii on cruise. 
And I know you flew the F-14B, but I want to stick to the A model at the moment. Um, you mentioned DACT sure. uh, just before. How did it fare against the types at the time? I mean, I, everyone knows that A was probably a bit underpowered compared to the B and the Ds. But uh, how did it fare against the types at the time? Uh, the F-14A, <clears throat> you know, you learn how to fly the airplane to its limits. I never once ever, ever feared my engines. I never lost a fight because of my engines. You might, you know, even though I'm even underpowered, yeah. I never lost a fight because of that. I lost a fight because I didn't fly a good enough airplane. Uh, I lost a fight because somebody else flew a better airplane. It always boils down to uh, who's driving the airplane. Mm -hmm. uh, if you take VN diagrams and lay them on top of each other, F-15, F-14, F-15 should always win. The F-16 should always win, but it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And the reason it doesn't is because Everybody flies an airplane differently than each other. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> what the F-14 taught me to do was to fly that airplane at its most efficient uh, parameters. So I flew the best airplane I could fly all the time. And if I went against an F-15 or F-16 or an A-4, uh, I forced him. He better fly his best airplane. If mm -hmm. he's not, I'm going to win. Yeah. So I, 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 I wasn't afraid to take the F-14 and – the A with the TF-30s, yeah, I had some stalls in them, but you know what? I caused all those stalls myself, mm -hmm. you know, from jacking the airplane around and yeah. cross-controlling it and doing stuff. Uh, I was a big believer in the angle attack. That's why the angle attack in the F-14 is pretty good size. It's mm -hmm. right there in your face. And I learned to uh, understand what that did for me and where I was. And it, 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 it enabled me to fly a very efficient airplane all the time. Mm-hmm. So how long did you spend on the A's before you got transferred to the B's, and how did this happen? I had uh, just about uh, 3,000 hours in the A, and then when I came back, uh, I went to the RAG, uh, 101 RAG, second time around as the maintenance officer, and I was there about six months. We got our first B's coming in, or F-14 A-pluses, and I got probably almost another 1,000 hours in the A-plus flying that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I learned uh, the characteristics of both aircraft uh, with, with the engines. You had the GE one-on-one -on -one engine and the B. Of course, you had a TF-30 and the A. Uh, one had a, uh, you know, a, a, a digital fuel control. The other one had just a normal mechanical fuel control. And I learned uh, what that did. And we, we started flying. What would happen is we'd take guys coming through like VF-24, VF-211 coming through, transitioning to the B, getting rid of their A's, we'd give them uh, <clears throat> three hops in the B, two FAM hops, and then the third hop would be a, a 1v1 against an A. Mm -hmm. And I'd take them out in the A and literally clean their clock because I knew in certain areas that the A could outperform the B. Wow, the really? slow. I Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Because what made the, what made the F-14A, because you had a mechanical fuel control, it could not regulate the air and the fuel, so you got your compressor stalls in there. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you took away air from the intake, the B had a digital fuel control, so it monitored all that. So it goes, ah, there's less air in the intake. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to down-tune the fuel here and give you less, less, less burner. Therefore, there are no stalls in the B. Mm -hmm. Well, when that would take place, you look over and you're flying the airplane, say, at 150 knots and about 60 degrees nose up in the B, and you look down. And you're in full zone five, but your engines are only in zone one. Wow. Okay. Because the digital fuel control recognizes the fact that it's only got limited air in there. So I'm going to give you limited fuel so you don't over torque install the engine. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, over here in the F-14A, you got a mechanical fuel control. It doesn't know. It's dumb. Mm -hmm. It's giving me all the air I want and all the fuel I want. As long as I'm flying a symmetric airplane, not control, cross controlling and taking the air out of the intakes, I've got more of a thrust, thrust on my airplane than the B does. Right, right, I see. So I would get those guys out there slow and then just, just I mean, then just hammer. Mm -hmm. And finally one day the skipper, uh, Sparky Lyle, came to me and says, Okay, you got to stop taking these guys out here and kicking their ass. They're all they're all wondering why they're flying the best airplane and they're not winning. And I go, hey, I'm sorry, you know. You know, I wasn't sorry, but I mean, you know, I learned from flying F-15 guys that their main, their main thing they do is lock their left arm in full burner and go, okay, you know, God, take care of me now. Well, that's not going to do it. You know, mm -hmm. if I'm flying a better airplane out there, you can have your left arm locked up in full burner. I'm still going to still, still beat you out there. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it takes guys 
to fly a smart airplane, know where the airplane performs the best. Mm -hmm. Is what was the difference between the A and the B? Was it literally just the engines, or was it also avionics? Well, avionics are all the same. <clears throat> uh, the B had the the, the B had the GE F one hundred one engine, which is about uh, twenty three, twenty four thousand pounds of thrust, depending on kind of where, what you looked at. Where the F fourteen A was twenty two, but had been down down tuned to about seventeen nine. Okay. Just because of the stall, inch and stall stuff you had in the airplane. So they kind of detuned it so you had a lot less thrust. Now, granted, uh, you could power yourself around out there in the F-14B as long as you kept it around 300 to, say, 400 knots. Uh, you're in a good regime out there. You're always got zone five. But you take an F-14A and run it to about 45,000 feet and put it in full burner, it will go and it will actually go faster than, than the B will go. No way, really. I'm really surprised about yeah, that. Yeah, because the ram air, the ram air effect is keeps putting this, keeps pumping more thrust, more thrust, more thrust, and mm -hmm. uh, you know I, I've had the F14, even the F14B down low, say at 100 feet, doing like 1.3, and I got I got to pull it back because mm -hmm. it wants to go faster. I mean, the F14 loves the ram air effect in the intakes, mm -hmm. and just keeps putting out more thrust and more thrust. And of course, aerodynamically, the wing starts slipping back on you. The next thing you know, you're a flying arrowhead. You know, it's, it's moving yeah. along. And I've had a few questions from our Twitter and Facebook followers, and they, they keep on asking me, how did the F-14B fare against, you know, the types at the time? Did you fly against the REF, uh, the, the French? Uh, what was it like? Uh, we never did any of that too much. We, uh, I wasn't... Uh... When we, I, I made my cruises in the Med, we were in F-14As and VF-31, and we didn't do uh, much. Uh, there were guys down at Dutch Romano, you know, down there against the, Earth, uh, the uh, Brits and stuff, but we didn't do a lot of, a lot of inter-service uh, fighting stuff. I, I know some squadrons went against the Israelis, and the Israelis were very, very uh, particular about what they wanted to do. They wanted can setups, and they said as long as nobody – takes pictures of someone getting gunned out there. They don't want that. Okay. And that was okay for about maybe a week or so. And then pictures started showing up with F-14s in the gun sites of the F-15 guys, you know, Israelis. And those those are all off of canned setups. And then the air wing said, okay, enough of that crap. From now on, uh, when you do that, we're going to drop our hook. So okay. once you drop the hook down, you show you're not out there really fighting the airplanes. So that kind of put a, put a spank X on the Israelis and doing that. Because they, they, they wanted the publicity. They didn't want their young lions going out there getting their butts kicked, you know, basically. Yeah, of so, course, of course, you know. yeah. And um, so I'm going to ask, it's probably maybe a bit difficult for you, but uh, no, 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 no. before we move on, uh, which did you prefer flying, the F-14A or B? Uh, I, li I liked the B just because it was newer. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I found out from being all the hours in the Tomcat, especially when I was maintenance saucer, that you more the more you flew the airplane, the more it stayed up and flew. Mm-hmm. So even even an old A that would be, you know, old and we and we got transferred from some squadron who it had been a hangar queen, we may spend, you know, a month getting it ready to fly, and then once we take it for a test stop, it stays up, and after that we flew it, and once you flew it all the time, it stayed up all the time. So I really didn't care because I had pretty well learned in flying the A where to fly it the best. Mm-hmm. And one of the uh, the best compliments I got one time was uh, down in Key West in a 2v2 um, against VF-45 down there, uh, F-16 and an A-4F. And I had a student on my wing. We were both flying two F-14As. And uh, the F-16, it was an in-model two-seater. In the back seat, they had Monroe Smith, who used to be CEO of Top Gun. At that time, he was uh, – Air Land Chief of Staff, and he came down just to, just to spend a week or so in Key West and fly. And we went out there and fought the uh, the VF-45 guys against them, and we came back to the debrief, and uh, the instructor looked at me and said, hey, Oki, uh, nice job flying the F-14B today. And I said, well, uh, I didn't have a B. I had an A. <laughs> That's probably the best compliment you can probably get. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So, um I've heard from your son James that you were perhaps the third or fourth uh, highest rated, you know, in terms of hours on the F-14. Is this true? Yeah, probably about thirty-nine hundred hours. I thought I had wow. four thousand at one time, but I had two logbooks, and one of them was the same logbook, the same hours on it, so I discounted that one there. And I ended up leaving with about thirty-nine hundred hours uh, Tomcat time. 
pretty amazing, OP, pretty amazing. Well, and, that's uh, all front seat time, myself and Dale Snodgrass. And the Snort has another 1,000 hours beyond that. And uh, they have two pilots have that much flight time in the Tomcat. It's, it's pretty amazing. Rios can probably get that a little easier, but yeah. they kind of ride in the back. But pilots, mm -hmm. uh, you're busy driving up there all the time. So, yeah. So it's very he, fortunate. Absolutely. So can you tell us what happens after uh, after your F-14 career? I think you went on to be XO and CEO of uh, VF-43, if I'm correct. In right, right. My XO uh, tour of the RAG, I was XO of the RAG. I went to war college for a year, came mm -hmm. back down to Oceana, and I assumed uh, XO and CO of VF-43, the adversary squadron down there flying A-4 and F-5s and F-16s. So before we move on to the F-5 and the F-16s, can you uh, describe what the aggressor squadron was actually for? Well, what we would do, we would have, uh, we had your basic, uh, like kind of like street corner, you know, ACM uh, training there for the, for the fleet squadrons. And then we'd run uh, FARPS, Fleet Fighter uh, Air Combat Readiness Program, where they'd go through a six-week course with 1v1s, 1v2s, 2v2s, 2v minis uh, for the whole squadron. And then they'd go through a, it's all the tax range. And uh, all, the, all my guys were all trained to, to score them and grade them, and then at the end of the, the FARP thing, they'd, we'd come out and get a grade for every every crew, every pilot, every Rio, the grades for them, that kind of stuff going through. And it was a very extensive, very uh, in-depth, detailed debrief for all the guys to to do go through that prior to them going on cruise. Because once you're going on cruise, especially in ACM, uh, the day you leave is, is the day that you're probably most – qualified to do ACM and every day after that you get worse and worse and worse because there's really no assets on cruise to go do ACM. And so by the time you get home, you can get beat up by your sister in a, in a balloon probably out there because <laughs> you're just not used to doing stuff, you know, basically. Yeah. So the guys, uh, my guys would, uh, we do daily ACM stuff with the rag with students training those guys. And then we do uh, the FARPs and stuff with uh, the fleet squatters. Brilliant. So the F-5 has also fascinated me. What was that like to fly? The F-5, to be honest, was kind of a disappointment. Okay. I mean, it looks it looks great on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, it's basically your Volkswagen. You go out there and throw the keys in. You start it up, and you're gone. There's no INS to deal with. It's just, I mean, you can – we let the fighters take off at least 30 minutes ahead of us, and then we go out and man up and be right, by, right behind them, you know, and, and it just uh, nothing to start up and, and taxi and get airborne. Uh, kind of heavy controls. It's hard to see. That's that's the only really plus it has. Uh, it had two J85 engines with afterburner on it, which uh, you know you could you could get mock in it no problem. But that's that's just about it. You weren't going to run anybody down. Uh, its biggest attribute was probably just hard to see. And basically, my mentality was: you see the F5, you beat the F5. Okay. If you don't see the F5, it's going to beat you. And uh, what makes it so popular now is because, again, it's like a mousetrap. It never breaks. It stays up all the time. Very, very simple. And that's why the, the reserve squadrons, you know, VFC uh, 13, VF uh, 111 down in Key West, have all gone to F5s because they're cheap to operate. Uh, they're very good uh, uh, force multipliers. So you can go out there in a 2VX and have no kidding the X out there with five or six uh, F5s doing their thing. Mm -hmm. And they're pretty simple to fly. You know, there's not a whole lot you can really get yourself in trouble doing with the F5 because you, it's tough to get the nose up because the nose is very, very heavy. Mm -hmm. And once it goes up, it wants to stay up. And then to get it back down again sometimes, you can run out of slits or airspeed and be stuck nose up. And that's when you need to know your inverted, uh, inverted pitch hang-up uh, procedures. Uh, otherwise, you're going to probably spin one in. But other than that, it, it was fun to fly. Like I said, again, heavy nose. To rotate it on takeoff, 
My first time, I thought I had to put both hands in the dash or both feet in the dash and, and get the nose up. Very, very heavy nose. Mm-hmm. So would, what's you say your, what's it was your, a, would you say it was a good, you know, adversary aircraft? Uh, the, the, the F-5 and the MiG-21 almost uh, not for not are almost identical in the diagram, VN diagram with each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, in some areas, the uh, MiG-21 a slow speed is better than the F-5. In some areas, the F-5 high speed is better than the MiG-21. But the MiG-21 and the F-5 are just about, you can lay them on each other, basically, schematic-wise, <clears> how <throat> they perform. Uh, and, and the bottom line is is the fact that the F-5 is so simple to operate mm-hmm. and too cheap to operate, and it never breaks. Yeah. And then you went on to fly the F-16N. F-16, yeah. So what F-16 was this like to fly? I mean, that was, apparently it's called a rocket ship. I mean, I think it had the same engine as the F-14B, if I'm correct. Yeah, GE F-101, the yep. Pratt & Whitney. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, the GE engine. Yeah, there's, there's two types. The Pratt & Whitney, which is the Lantern F-16, which the Air Force has. And the Navy has the GE F-101, uh, F-110 engine uh, the Navy has. Mm-hmm. We had the N model, which had the A radar in it. And I went down to McGill Air Force Base for six weeks. Kind of a typical Air Force deal. Uh, I had two flights, and I'm going to be there for six weeks to get two flights out. So <laughs> kind of uh, an overkill and, yeah. and, and nauseum to get through. Uh, so I went down there. It was, it was nice. I got two flights. And I told them when I left, I said, hey, I said this is on a Monday. By the time I get to Friday, I'll have flown the airplane uh, seven more times, and I'll be full up round in ACM. And they went like, what? Wow. You know, that, that, that's, that's the Air Force for you. That's okay. Wow. Yeah. And so I went down to uh, McDill, did the two flights, uh, came home, and no kidding, uh, you know, four days later, I had two hops a day, and I was full up around ACM. And the, AC, the airplane just uh, is awesome in ACM. It's just, it is a rocket mm-hmm. ship. Yeah. I mean, uh, I've never had an airplane that uh, when you're going downhill and, and mock at mock, uh, you take it out of burner. If you're not prepared for it, you'll get that uh, kind of mock tuck as it goes back through transonic flight again. And if you're not prepared for it, it will throw your your eye teeth up on the dash. I mean, it'll get your attention quickly wow. as it decels. Mm-hmm. And they happened to me one time, and I said, that will never happen to me ever again. Because <laughs> you did, did kind of a parabolic you know, negative bun over as it came back through mock again. And it, I mean, I was up on the dash uh my teeth are banging off the dash up there in the HUD. It got my attention big time. <laughs> but it will – it, 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 it can run down anything. I mean, the F-14s will start their bug out, and we'd be – if we're uh, three miles, three to five miles, we'd run down. Wow. Go full burner run down. So how did the F-16N fare against the F-14A or B? Uh, unfortunately, uh, again, if guys aren't flying the airplane smart, and, and of course the F-16 is uh, a different animal itself, uh, you can go out there and pretty well spank the crap out of them, unfortunately. I mean, it's, it's no embarrassment because, you know, the guys that are flying the F-16 are really, really good, mm-hmm. and they're supposed to be good. And the guys flying the F-14, A's and B's, you know, they're fleet guys. They don't do that stuff every day. Mm-hmm. It's kind of an unfair assessment because I used to get so upset when I was a youngster flying against the Top Gun guys out of Miramar when I was out there and find some old guy one day grabbed me and said, look, those guys do that three times a day, mm. every single day, six days a week. So there's no way that you can possibly even be nearly as good as those guys. And I go, okay, all right, you're right, you're right. So to expect the, the fleet aviator in his F-14A or B to go out there and beat up on an F-16 is a pretty much an unreasonable uh, expectation for him. Yeah. But the best idea is just let him go out there and experience that and then have him realize this is an environment that they don't want to get into. Mm-hmm. Because so, basically, in this day and age, if you get to the merge and no one's died, it's not good for anybody. Of course, yeah, of course. The weapons everybody has, yeah. So, how did you feel using? Because obviously, the F sixteen has a side controller rather than a center stick. How did you feel about that? I love the side stick. I mean, my second flight uh, in the F uh, sixteen. I mean, you're used to it after about maybe an hour in the first flight. My, my third flight in it was basically back at Oceana with me on the wing, and we're doing a section takeoff, my wow. third flight. Wow. And it does it does a beautiful section takeoff. I mean, you can just literally just slightly milk the nose up. It's so sensitive and so squared away. It's awesome. So I'm, I'm a big side stick guy. I, I love side stick. 
Yeah, and how did you find the cockpit? I mean, was the F sixteen N was it still analog or did it have digital uh, glass screens at the time? It uh, it's uh, the F sixteen. The, the primary instrument on the airplane is the uh, attitude indicator up on the on the dash itself. Mm -hmm. Vice the F eighteen, the HUD is the primary instrument. Uh, instrument uh, for the for the F eighteen is the HUD. Mm -hmm. So for the F sixteen. It's all analog and uh, you know, uh, you know digital attitude indicator in there. But that's really it was, it was fine. It was no problem. Mm -hmm. The thing you need to get used to is that when you sit in the cockpit, uh, the canopy rails go down to your waist. Really? So when you're flying, yeah. So when you're flying IFR in, in clouds, you know the common tendency is for a guy like you're flying F-14s, just kind of get kind of hunkered down and kind of get you know, lower in the cockpit. And, see the instruments well the f-16 you're up there in the clouds you're right there in the clouds yeah. on both sides of you so it's a little bit different uh thinking so you had to really concentrate to as you lean back seeing the the, the instruments up here in front of you to make sure you're squared away mm -hmm. but once you did that uh it was a great cockpit i, I really uh, liked it it's very roomy and comfy the first time i got into it uh i kind of fell into it because <laughs> they, they don't really show you how to get into it the first time but you actually kind of bite back your butt into it first. So, because I'm all, and you're used to going up there and again, slinging yourself kind of your one leg over mm -hmm. in the cockpit and sitting down. That's not how you get in the F 16. You actually kind of crawl up on the rail and sling your butt in first and bring your right leg up over mm -hmm. the HUD and back down the, the foot well and you kind of back into it. And the same way when you get out, you kind of, kind of back out of it, kind of crawl out of it the same way when you get out of it. Mm -hmm. And did you ever fly against, you know, the U.S. Air Force, or was it just strictly Navy? We flew uh, most all the time against uh, the Navy. I do remember, though, when I was in Tomcats, uh, in VF-31, we went out to Hill Air Force Base and spent two weeks on an ACM dead out there against the Air Force, against their F-16s. And Air Force flies their F-16s different than what the Navy does. Mm -hmm. You know, most all the Air Force, they put two tanks on them, and most all the F-16 squadron, or almost probably all of them, are all air-to-mud types. So right, they yeah. really, really love dropping bombs. And when it comes to ACM, they're kind of a little bit foreign. And so they don't fly the airplane as probably demonstrative as the Navy does. Mm -hmm. You know, we love to fly the F-16, zero airspeed, 100 knots, 150 16, 80, 90 degrees nose up, zero airspeed, go ballistic, go park it up there. And the Air Force, they get below 200 knots, and they're, scre they're screaming, knock it off, knock it off, knock it off. Wow, okay. So it's a whole different uh, mentality. Yeah. And, and the F-16, I've taken the airplane uh, 150 knots, bring the nose full to 90 degrees nose up, let it go ballistic. Uh, take the stick, go full forward, and stand on a rudder. And the thing will literally do a reversal pirouette right in front of you up there, just swap ends. Wow, that it really is a powerhouse, tank. isn't it? Boy, bloody hell. Oh, yeah. You're back at idle. Take your full burner, slam it idle, hit the, the rudder, bottom rudder, and then bump the stick over, and it'll swap ends right there, and you're back in the burner again. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. Wow. We love doing that. I can imagine. And the Air Force just, uh, they, they didn't understand that. They, oh, that's, that's too slow. And I go, well, not really. I mean, <laughs> so we, that's, we like it right there. Big exactly, time. yeah. And did you always fly uh, the F-16 clean? Yeah, we did. We had the what we call the station wagon model, which is a two-seater, and because it took off with about uh, 2,000 pounds less gas than the mm -hmm. slicks, we put a, a centerline tank on it. And mm -hmm. I remember one time when I first got the squatter, guys were complaining about flying the station wagon model, the two-seater, and I'm going like, what? what? What is your problem? Well, six months later, I was complaining about flying the two-seater because <laughs> you didn't have the pitch pulse you had in the, the two-seaters you had in the slick. Wow. And at one or two degrees less, you know, in your mind, you thought it made a difference. You still could go out there in the in the TF-16, the two-seater, and still kick ass on anything that flew. Oh, yeah. And many of our viewers and myself see the F-16N in these sort of Soviet colors. Was that on purpose? Uh, I think probably so. I mean, that's kind of funny. I mean, uh, the only people that get really kind of revved up over the paint schemes are mm. you guys. <laughs> you know, civilian types. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, the, the, the us, we don't really care. I mean, yeah. we don't sit there and go like, "Well, gee, I'm going to fly the the Soviet Czechoslovakian paint job." We yeah, never look. We don't really care. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I didn't notice that until I got to be uh, bigger on Facebook the last three or four years. Mm -hmm. When guys talk about bureau numbers, uh, what was the bureau number? 
we never looked at the bureau numbers. I couldn't tell you a bureau number from my own social security number, basically. We never looked at this. <laughs> You know, it wouldn't, wouldn't anything at all. Yeah, there's some big odd geeks out there certainly looking to stuff like that. So, Oki, how long did you spend uh, flying the A4, F5, and the F-16 with the aggressors? I was there uh, a little over two years, and then I uh, uh, have a change of command, and then I went to the Eisenhower as an operations officer in the Eisenhower. Could you tell us a bit about that? Well, you know, you spend your whole career avoiding a ship's company tour because that's not uh, <laughs> beneficial to uh, career enhancement sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I went there, and it was kind of a learning curve for me, which I didn't like. So right. I spent a year there, and I said, okay, I'm done. I'm out of here. So, so that I was retired you. That was you done, yeah. 96, and I, I, I had enough. I'm done. <laughs> So, Oki, do you have any hobbies? Well, unfortunately, I, I'm uh, your typical Navy fighter guy. My, I, I don't play golf. Uh, I don't hunt. I don't fish. Uh, my youngest son's got me into guns, so I, 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 I've got guns. I've got ammo, so I kind of fit that type. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm into uh, die-cast models. Oh, likewise, I, likewise. I, I, I bought my first one about probably six, seven years ago. And now I have so many, I'm embarrassed to tell you. So uh, I, I've got a lot of models. And uh, a lot of them I've got the, my name on the side that I flew, which is kind of cool. Yes. I think and, it's uh, it uh, uh, – sorry that? for interrupting you. Is it a Sentry Wings that you have your name on? I think it's by that company. Uh, you're right. You're right. Yep. Uh, there's actually a uh, 148 scale Hasegawa model, 202, a VF-31 that uh, has my name on that one there. And then Sentry Wings – uh, has another VF-31-202 uh, is my name on that airplane there. And I bought that one there about three years ago because I realized my name was on it. I didn't know it. Wow. And I bought it. And now that, that model is now gone. There's no more left. You can't find them anyplace. So, that must yeah. be a, an absolute privilege, though, to see your well, name it's, it's on so the surprising. side. I, I, I guess you can, I can be famous in my own little mind because I, I made it to the model world, you know? <laughs> exactly. That is absolutely great, Oki. <laughs> But, uh, okay, so move on. So uh, do you have, well, this could be a very tough one, a favorite aircraft you've flown in your career? I guess probably the F-14. I mean, I really just, uh, you know, an airplane fit me, and I just, uh, that's what I instructed in. And, you know, I just thoroughly enjoyed, uh, my, my game plan was when I left my first squadron mm -hmm. and I went to the RAG, uh, I had about 1,200 F-14 hours, and I left via 51. And I thought I was pretty damn good. And then I got to the RAG, and I realized I didn't know anything. <laughs> I thought I was good. And I'd gone through Top Gun and thought I was really good. And I realized that looking back on it, man, I was average at best. And I said, I need to get better at this. And so I, I made it my mission when I was in the RAG as an instructor to be the best I could. And then after I was there a year, they made me the ACM phase leader for the next two years. So I ran the whole ACM phase in VF-101 for two years there, you know. So I, you know, they were paying me back as being uh, one of the best. And I got to fly the airplane all the time, ACM, you know, two or three hops a day. I made all the Key West debts. And as you go along from 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 hours, you really, really do know the airplane and you know where to fly it and how to fly it. And uh, it's a nice – Nice confidence builder, self-assured for yourself when you fly the airplane. Yeah, I think you're a very lucky man. I mean, I'm very envious, uh, especially of your F-14 and F-16 time. But uh, is there an aircraft you wish you could have flown that you didn't get the chance to? I wish I could have flown the F-15. I think the okay. F-15 is a is a monster airplane. Mm -hmm. I think that airplane just, uh, I like the way it sounds, I like the way it, uh, when it takes off the gear. Typical Air Force airplane, the gear come up in about Two seconds, you know, our gear drag up real slow. We've got 3,000 PSI bringing the heavy main mounts up. F-15 rotates, boom, the gear's gone in about two seconds. Man, they, they suck them up. Wow, yeah. It's got great thrust to weight and a uh, great uh, uh, weapon system inside there. So I would have loved to have been uh, an F-15 driver. But the problem is that if you do that, uh, exchange tour, you pretty well take yourself out of the hunt. You, you kind of go off the beaten right. path. And people forget who you are. And you get a one-on-one -on -one fit and support. And it doesn't do you any good, and you come back, and sometimes you don't get back in the airplane again. So I, I didn't want to do that. Yeah. 
So before we go, Oki, can you give us some stats? Like how many traps did you get in your career and how many out of flying hours have you got? I got uh, 6,000 fighter hours. I got 850 traps. Wow. Of which about 300 of those are at night. And in my airline career, I've got probably counting my Navy time, I got about probably 24, 25,000 hours. Wow. So <laughs> right up there then. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a lot of time, though, airline-wise, is sitting and eating. You know, you sit there and you eat. You know, that's all you do. So. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> well, Oki, okay, I want to thank you very much for being on the show. It's been a pleasure hearing your story, and I'm sure our viewers are going to enjoy it also. Well, I appreciate it very much. Anytime you want to do this again or anything else, please, uh, I'm, I'm willing to, this is it's so, it's so nice of you to do this. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, the pleasure's all mine, Oki. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you, pal. Bye-bye. <laughs>